Hello, everybody. Welcome to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're going to address a question that I get pretty often, and this question is how to reverse engineer a PCB layout from your Gerber files. Now, this is a question I sometimes get on LinkedIn. I've gotten it by email, and it's also a project request that I sometimes decline because it just takes too much time. However, I just learned there's a feature in Altium Designer for that, so we're going to look at how to do this a couple different ways and then I'm gonna show you how to do this using Camtastic in Altium Designer. Make sure to hop into Altium Designer and follow along. Let's get started. Now, reverse engineering a PCB layout from Gerber files requires more than just your Gerber files, but at a very bare minimum, you can start with your standard Gerber artwork and then your drill files. So our inputs or Gerbers, either in the standard uh, X or X2 format. And then we also have our drill files or .drl files. So we need these because this data in your drill file is going to overlay on your pads in your Gerbers. And then your PCB editor can use those two pieces of data to reconstruct drill holes in the PCB layout. Now, the other thing that you might need is a net list. So a net list, such as like IPC format, is going to be really useful because it's going to allow the PCB editor or your CAM tool to then assign the correct names to whatever connections it extracts from the Gerbers. So these are the three inputs that we generally need. This one here obviously is required. The Gerbers contain all of your layer information, all of your copper information, silk screen, solder mask, paste mask, everything that you need. And it even includes your mechanical layers if the mechanical data was exported originally from the native CAD tool. So you could also have your mechanical data here. Also, you do need the drills, assuming that you have drills in your PCB, since most PCBs do have drills. You'll probably also have a .drl file. Now, the net list is not necessarily required because some CAM tools can extract a net list and it's going to contain the same data as you might have in like an IPC netlist. The difference is that the IPC netlist will have specific net names, whereas if you extract a netlist from these two files, that extracted netlist is just going to have generic names. So it will just name them something like net 0001, 0002, so on and so forth until all of the nets are named. So these are your basic inputs that you'll need to then reconstruct your PCB layout from your fabrication files. When we talk about reverse engineering, we need to then ask the next question, what exactly are we reverse engineering? Well, of course, we want to get a PCB layout, but what we can't get is the schematics. These tools that are used to do reverse engineering are not going to give you a schematic drawing. And actually, I'm not aware of any reverse engineering tool that will give you schematics. However, they will give you the PCB layout, and it's going to show where all of the copper elements are and all of the elements on the other layers. So it at least gives you back a file that you can load in to a CAD tool, and then you can make modifications using the standard features in your CAD tool. So now that we know what files we need to input into our CAM tool in order to get out a PCB layout, what exactly is the CAM tool going to do with those files? Well, like I said, you're starting with Gerbers and again, starting with drills as your required files. What you could do with these two sets of files is you could export these to a DXF file. So if you're familiar with DXF format, that is a format that's used in AutoCAD, LibreCAD, some other CAD drafting tools. This is a vendor neutral drafting format. Many different programs can use this, including your PCB layout software. Once you have, let's say, your copper layers exported as a DXF file, the DXF file can then be re-imported into your CAD tool on a mechanical layer. Then after it's imported, you can transfer that mechanical layer to a copper layer, and now you have an image of all of those copper connections transferred into the PCB layout. So that's one way you can get from Gerber all the way to CAD. Now, is there any problem with this? Well, as it turns out, there is a bit of a problem with this because inside your Gerber file, you have things like polygons, 
you have things like planes. And remember, plane is a specific type of layer definition within Gerber's. And then you also have traces. The problem is that Gerber files do not distinguish between polygons and traces. They just appear as pieces of copper. If you were to export your Gerber to a DXF, the polygons and traces are not going to be distinguishable in the DXF. They're all just going to look like connected pieces of copper. So once you bring that DXF back into your CAD program, the CAD program is going to interpret everything as a fill. And maybe it will be able to transform those fills into polygons so that you can at least manipulate them with a polygon tool. So it's a big question mark as far as how this comes back into your CAD tool and what you can really do with it. Kind of depends on the capabilities of your CAD tool. The other piece of information that's contained in these inputs is your drills. And those are used for things like vias or non-plated through holes. So once all of this is exported to a DXF, how is it used? Well, essentially what happens is the DXF just tells you locations where the drills are placed. They actually don't say anything about like the via lands or anything like that. Via lands are placed in the copper layer. So once you put this back into the CAD tool, the CAD tool may not realize that you actually want to reconstruct via objects from the data in this drill file. And so the result is that you might just get a bunch of drill markers all over the PCB layout, and then you have to manually place those holes and then redefine the hole sizes from your drill table and then redefine those hole definitions in terms of plated or non-plated, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of manual that reconstruction if you go this DXF export route and then go into your CAD tool. So Altium Designer contains the Camtastic tool inside of it, and the Camtastic tool will actually let you bypass this DXF route and just go straight into a PCB layout in the PCB editor. So it's a really convenient way to bypass all of this and just reconstruct things like polygons, traces, and vias directly inside of the PCB editor. Now, same thing applies. We're only dealing with a PCB layout. We're not regenerating a schematic. And unfortunately, if you don't have the native schematic files or a PDF of your schematics, you'll then have to reconstruct all of that information in a project in order to do much more manipulation on this board. However, once you do get the PCB layout into the PCB editor, you can then start modifying it and then you can regenerate new outputs from your modified board. So let's hop into Altium Designer, take a look and see how this works. So to get started, I'm inside of Altium Designer. The first thing I need is a new Camtastic document. You just go up to File, New, and Cam Document. And you don't need to do this inside of a project. Um, and in fact, I could pull this out of a project and just leave it as a free document if I want. The project that we're gonna look at for this example is our power regulator project. So we looked at this in some other videos a while ago, and this power regulator project has been produced and tested and everything works good. And we have all of the outputs. Now, typically when you begin this type of project, you're gonna have some of the output files. You may not have everything, but you usually have some of it. The stuff that you need at minimum is right here, your Gerbers and your NC drill files. Now I could also do this with NC drill files and ODB++ files. So I have my ODB database right here. Typically people just have the Gerber and the NC drill files. Now the other thing that people will typically have when they begin this type of project are PDFs of the schematics and the fabrication document. So here I have the fab drawing all drawn up. I have all of my layer extensions listed here under the Gerber column for the layer stack. And then here you can see there's not much in the schematics because it's a pretty simple board, but I have the schematics here as well. Now, when you have the schematics like this document here, you could go back and reverse engineer all of this just to get to the schematics in your CAD tool. So you would need the schematics and then of course the BOM, as long as you had those two pieces of information, you can then reverse engineer just the schematics. Now, what about the PCB layout? So that's where you need to go back here into something like Camtastic and then go through an import process to get all of the copper layer data into this project and then you can export it to a PCB. So to do this, I'm gonna to go to File, import, and then you see here I have a few options. I have Gerber, ODB, Netlist, and Drill, and then any routing as well. So you can work with routes or board cutouts that are routed into the PCB. So let's start with a Gerber file. Here I'm already in the Gerber folder. I'm just going to select everything 
and hit open, you'll see it comes up with a log. And then if you go back to the CAM document, open up the CAMtastic panel, you'll see here that we have all of the layer data imported into this window. And I can turn the layers off and on. I can go through and do all the stuff that any CAM operator would need to do if they were inspecting this board before fabrication. The next thing we need to do, go back here to the import menu and then go over to drill. Now, you need to select a particular folder that has your drill information in it. So you can see I have this NC drill folder. This follows the standard format that I use in my out job files where everything is put into its own folder. I'm gonna go over here and then hit select folder. And then you'll see here that there are two files in this directory that we wanna work with. Here I can select one or both of them. I'm just gonna select them both and then hit okay and it's gonna import all of that drill information. So now you see here that I have an additional layer inside of the cam view. This additional layer shows me where all of my drills are located in the PCB. So you can see these little green dots. Those are all of my drills. Of course, if I turn this off, we just get back to the previous view. So you've got a lot of important information in this document. Now there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do inside of Camtastic. And I'm not a cam operator, so I don't know what these guys have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. However, if you just go in here, you can do stuff like analyze DRC rules. You can then look for invalid polygons. You can measure things. You can uh, place different objects in this window. These are some of the typical things that someone might have to do when they're correcting a design before they send it in for fabrication and then ultimately assembly. What you need to do as a PCB designer who wants to reverse engineer something, you now need to take this and then convert it into one of those two formats that will then allow you to go directly into your CAD tool. So from here, we have two possibilities. We can go up to file and then export, and you can see here under the export menu, I can immediately export something to a DXF. So right here, I can select just one or all of these layers and export everything into a DXF file. Once I do that, I could then go through manually manipulate things in a drafting tool and then bring it back into a CAD program. The other option here, if you go to the export menu, is you'll see down here grayed out, there's an option for export to PCB. So this is the other route that I mentioned earlier. You can actually export this directly into a PCB layout that will appear in the PCB editor in Altium Designer. But there's one thing that we have to do first. What we have to do now is we need to extract the net list directly from the Gerber data and then we can use that data to reconstruct the PCB layout. So to extract the netlist, we need to go to tools and then netlist and extract. After clicking on that, you'll notice that this part of the panel just filled up with a bunch of entries here. And you'll see as I click through them, it's zooming and snapping to these different objects in the PCB layout. These are all of our nets that have been identified from the different copper connections inside of this set of Gerbers. So you can see here that quite a few of these are polygons. And if you look back at the original video with this PCB layout, we did a lot of this with polygons. You can see here that this big, large white one, this is actually our polygon that is bounding all of this stuff on this top layer. So if I turn off everything, and then just turn on the back layer, you can also see where some of these uh, polygons arise. They aren't obvious when just looking at the top layer. So this lets you scroll through and look at all the different nets. But you'll notice here that all of the nets have default names, just like I mentioned before. And that's because we didn't import a net list for this board. Now, sometimes you don't have the net list, you just have the Gerbers. But if you do have the net list, you can go down here to File, Import, and then netlist. And then you just navigate to the folder with your netlist, select that folder, and then that file in the directory that contains all of your net information will appear in this window. You can hit okay, and it will import. And so that will assign names to the different nets, and those will match the entries in your netlist. So we're just gonna continue with the default names. It's okay, we don't need to have the specific names here identified in this example. So now that we have all of this, what we can do is we can then go back to file, and then export. And now that we've gone through and extracted all the nets, we can actually export to the PCB. 
So let's see what happens when we click this button and we'll see if we get something that we can actually use. Here's what the export to PCB looks like. Now this is really interesting here because it's done a few things that I think might not have been expected. So first things first, if you look at this set of Gerbers inside of Camtastic, what you'll notice here is that we have all the copper information, we have all the mask information, and then we have the top and bottom silk screen. What we don't have is a board outline. Sometimes Gerbers will include the board outline, sometimes they won't. I am a firm believer that you should generally export a board outline, especially if it's a unique shape. If it's just a simple rectangle like this, you don't necessarily have to export the board outline. But what you'll see here is that in the exported PCB, it actually drew out the outline for us. We didn't have to specify it manually. That's actually contrary to what you would have to deal with if you were to do a DXF export from the Camtastic data. If you were gonna do a DXF export, you would also need to export the board shape or you would have to have it in a Gerber layer. You could also just have a DXF that has a board shape separately and then you could import that into the PCB editor and then apply it just as you would in a mechanical layer with any other mechanical layer. So let's look around at this PCB layout and see what we have here as far as the converted objects. So you can already see here, we, it looks like we have traces that were created in this PCB layout. And indeed, if I use the selection filter, hit tracks, you can see here that some of these are recreated as actual tracks in the PCB layout. So round of applause, because that's exactly what we would want from a converter that helps us reverse engineer a PCB from our Gerbers. And we have several tracks in here. And you can even see that it's extracted the width exactly as we had in the original layout. So that's great. And that's really nice because remember, Gerber data does not have that hard coded into it. It's actually inferred from the photo plot data. So we have all of these different tracks that are placed automatically. Now, what's all this other stuff? You'll notice here that we have several different outlines here. Well, these outlines are actually the outlines of our polygons that are used to make all of our other connections. So I'll remind you again, if you check out the previous video, you'll see that a lot of the connections were actually drawn with polygons, not with tracks. It's pretty standard with power products. How do we make sure that these polygons are going to allow us to reconstruct the board correctly? Your first instinct, I think, would be to go to T, G, and then A to re-pour all of the polygons. And if I just re-pour all the polygons, we actually get that we don't have the correct set of connections here. And you can see that from these ghost wires here. You have these ghost wires that are trying to connect between these different pads. They were originally connected, if you look at the CAM document, because you can see right here, you've got your polygon right here connecting this pad on L1 over here to this pad on U1, but it's not connecting here in the PCB layout. Why is that? Well, whenever you have a polygon pour error like this, it's usually because the order of pouring is incorrect. So that's one of the things that you need to clean up when you go back and do this kind of reverse engineering. You need to go into the polygon manager and then you need to fix the pour order. So as soon as you go into the polygon manager, you're gonna see a lot of information in here that is going to help you uh, correct this PCB so that it has all the correct data. Looking at the top layer, we can see here that we have a very backwards order for our polygon pour. So this very large polygon, it should actually be poured last, not first. All Team Designer or, and any other PCB editor, frankly, is not going to know that it needs to be poured first or last. It's just gonna order them in some way, some kind of default arrangement, and it's just gonna give you the list. So it's up to you as the designer to go back and check all of these polygons Make sure that they are poured in the correct order so that way you don't have this issue with any open circuits um, after the pour. So let's move some of these up. We're gonna move some of these polygons around so that they pour correctly. Generally what I try to do is pour the successively larger ones farther down the list and then eventually this final bounding polygon is gonna get poured last and that's gonna be all of our fill on this top layer. So we need to do the same thing on the bottom layer but let's first just check the top layer and make sure that we have this correct. So now if I go to TG and A and re-pour everything, you see that it does re-pour. And if I just turn on single layer mode, you can now see here that it's very easy to check this against the CAM document. So I'm just gonna turn off all of the layers on the CAM document, turn on just the top layer. And now you can see that we have a really easy way to just compare straight across between these two layers and the pour order is reproducing 
the copper correctly as we have in the cam data. So that's great, that's exactly what we want. So now let's go back in because you can see here, I have this ghost wire right here between this pad on U1 and this set of vias on the right side of L1. Well, the reason for that is because if we look on the bottom layer, we see that we also have the wrong pour order on the bottom layer. And you can always verify that by looking over here in the cam document, turning on the bottom layer, and now it's very clear that these don't match. So again, go back into the Polygon Manager, scroll down to that bottom layer, and then modify that pour order. And just use the same strategy. This large polygon that's gonna cover everything and essentially provide copper fill, we just move it down to the bottom. These successively larger ones, we move them down lower, and then we're eventually just gonna be left with these other two that don't interfere with each other, and then we can hit okay. And then once we re-pour everything, there we go. We've now reproduced this bottom layer in our PCB directly from our cam data. So that's exactly what we wanted. That's perfect. So now that we've gone through, we've fixed all the copper, we've re-poured the polygons, we've gone in and we've verified that we don't have any leftover ghost wires, everything's connected. Let's take a look at this in 3D and see what else we can see. So once I'm here in 3D, it looks a little odd because we have this big solder mask opening here and we have some big solder mask openings here. So that's kind of interesting, right? All of these different drilled holes, they're all connected together and they're all passing through a single piece of copper. But the solder mask opens up around them and we don't really need that in this board. And in fact, in the original PCB layout, all of these were tented. So they were intentionally tented and we wanna make sure that we can reproduce that in this PCB layout. So how do we fix that? Well, what we need to do is go up to design and rules. And if we had this inside of a project, we could then play with all of these different rules and modify them so that it reproduces the same rules that we had in the original PCB layout. And that would solve things like the solder mask problem. The other thing that we could do is if I just go over here and click on this hole, you'll notice here that Altium Designer actually reproduced a hole here, exactly like we had in the other PCB. Now this hole, you'll notice it applied a default solder mask expansion. And it's actually a pretty big solder mask expansion of 21 mils on the bottom layer. So we could set that to let's say one mil, link them together, and then you'll notice here that this big pink circle around it kind of disappears. And if we go back and look in 3D, you'll see here that this has actually been removed just as we want. So that's gonna closely match to what we have in the original PCB layout. Same thing with these vias. If I go through and select all of these different vias, you'll notice here that on the top layer, it applied a 24 mil solder mask expansion around those vias. Let's just say I tent them and then link top and bottom. Then if I go into the 3D view, you can see here that they are in fact tented just as we want. So you need to then go through and just check all of this stuff because there is some cleanup that needs to be done. And if you make creative use of the selection filter, you're gonna be able to select all those different objects, go through them one by one, make sure your design rules are applied, and then you'll be able to reproduce the original PCB layout without any problems. So what other cleanup do we need to do in this layout? First, if you just check out the overlay layers, so your silk screen, you'll notice that some of these may not actually be text objects. So for example, this whole thing. This was applied as a text object. The problem is that it doesn't reproduce as a text object. If I select all of this, you will see that this is actually a region or a fill. So just selecting this, you'll see here that it is an object and you can manipulate it if you want, but it's not a text object. So you wouldn't be able to manipulate this with a text editor. If you wanted to change this part number, what I would recommend you do is just delete it and then use the standard text tool to fill in a new part number. So that's perfectly fine. Same thing on the top layer. You know, all of these reference designators, these are just applied as objects. Uh, it looks like a fill object in the PCB layout. Um, and it's not applied as a text editable object. The other thing that is important to note is that if you were to look at this, you would think that there are some components here, as in component objects within the parlance of ECAD software. However, if I turn on my component selection filter and I try just selecting stuff here in the layout, you notice I'm not selecting anything. 
That's because when you do this type of conversion, you aren't actually importing any data about the component itself. All you're doing is importing the layer information. You won't have the ability to move components around once you get this board into this state. How do you fix that? Is there any way to fix it? Well, yes, there is a way to fix it. That would require that you reproduce the schematics inside of a project. Then once you reproduce the schematics and you have all of the footprints for those schematics, then you can go back and do placement for all of these different components. Now, the placement for all these different components is really crit critical, but you can actually reproduce the placement just by looking at this PCB layout. Because you can see here, I can see exactly where all of the pads are for all my different components. And because I have the data from the silk screen imported into this PCB layout, I can also see exactly where the components are supposed to sit. So that's really useful. This gets you about halfway there to having a PCB layout file that is fully reproduced just from Gerber's. It at least gets you all the layer information and all the connection information that you would need, but it doesn't get you over the finish line. You have to actually go back and manually reproduce schematics and then import those components into the PCB layout once you do that, you can really start editing everything that you see here in this window in Altium Designer. Thanks for watching this video, everybody. Make sure to check out the video links in the description. One of those videos is to the original project where we actually designed this power regulator. The other video is to a podcast episode with Ethan Pierce. He's a specialist in reverse engineering PCBs, including reverse engineering from a physical PCB. So make sure to check out that podcast for some great insights. Thanks for watching everybody. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, leave your comments and questions in the comments section. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator folks. Yeah.